Good morning. I'm Reverend Kathy Itson, and on behalf of this wonderful community of Parkway, Robbinsdale Parkway United Church of Christ, I'd like to welcome everyone to the service. We have a cast of thousands today. I'm not quite sure how that ended up happening, but it's, it's a joy. So it's nice to see people. We're sorry that we physically cannot have everyone here because we would enjoy that much more. But we've got what we've got, and we appreciate your tuning in and celebrating with us in the virtual space. We have several announcements today. Um, first of all, um, my co-pastor, Reverend T. Michael Rock, is on vacation today, so we wish him and his family um, a blessed week. And Diane Starr is stepping in to help with some of the prayers and things that I usually share with T. Michael. We have a few announcements today. Um, one is we'd like everybody to pay attention to your e-blast, and if you didn't notice it, Go back and look at it because an important question for us as a community is what do we want to do for Christmas Eve, if anything? Um, do we want to, well, we'll certainly have online service, but do we want to take this opportunity and have several different services of different um, limits of people so that we have the opportunity to celebrate um, in physically or not? Do we prefer to stay home and be safer in that way? And so, we can arrange to have several different services. Perhaps one is with 20 people, one is with 40 people, whatever, or not to do that at all and to do it online, but we don't know really what the congregation prefers. And so we have put a survey out there with some times, with some sizes, and with the option of not coming at all or having any person in-person services at all. And we really want to hear from you in the next couple weeks because we will base our decision based on what this congregation wants to do. So please pay attention to that and vote and, and vote in one way um, of what you prefer. Secondly, um, we are going to be having a blood drive again this Tuesday. Blood is especially needed during this time of COVID with additional resources being tapped um, and the need being greater. So we are offering another um, blood drive and this Tuesday from 1 to 7 here, and we'd like people to come to that and donate if you're able to do that. We will have Cherish the Church, which is our twice yearly um, coming together and fixing things up. We're going to be doing it differently this year. There's going to be a list of needs posted. So someone such as myself could say, I'm not going to come when there's a bunch of other people there because of my compromised immune status, but I will come on a Tuesday afternoon when there's nobody and do my little part then. So you can sign up for what you want to do, but for those who would like to join together and do things appropriately socially distanced, we will have that on Saturday, November 7th. November 8th, excuse, no, November 7th. And then the following Sunday, November 8th, is Stewardship Sunday. So we're kicking that off today with our first stewardship speakers, which will be Shar and Greg Mertz. Um, and we thank them for their willingness to come and talk to us today. And then lastly, there will be a scavenger hunt for the youth in Oasis next Sunday at 2 o'clock. Um, they will meet in the parking lot with their phones and take pictures of scavenger things around the neighborhood, a new way of doing scavenger hunts, and those will be posted. So that sounds fun and crazy, and that pretty much describes our Oasis youth group. All right. Those are the announcements. We'd like you to um, think of the prayer requests and remember that it takes, uh, there's a little bit of a time lapse between your typing it in, your um, texting it in, and our getting that. So think of those and let us know. Thank you. We always want to keep you in prayer. Diane? Good morning, Robbinsdale Parkway. It is a pleasure to be here today with you. We have uh, two joys already. Lisa Strassner, and I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Her oldest granddaughter is 18 today. So we wish her a happy birthday. <laughs> and uh, Lisa says someone in her office tested positive for COVID. She went and got tested. She is thankful she is negative. Nancy and Dick Larson are thankful that their son-in-law, Jay Hulse, is, is cancer-free. Amen. Amen. But they ask us to keep in their prayers their other son-in-law, A.J. Hull. 
He is continuing to heal from his prostate cancer. He is in stage four, um, but he has been living for years with it. We have uh, Tracy Fugel, prayers for Zella, who tested positive for COVID this week. Other prayer requests? Yes, Kathy. Uh, Carol, Carol Anderson is having bladder surgery, on, uh, bladder cancer surgery this Friday, so I'd like to keep her in my prayers. Carol Anderson is having bladder cancer surgery this Friday at Mayo. Yes. At Mayo, let us keep Carol and Kathy and their family Lori Myron Manbeck, please pray for my daughter Catherine's friend who is having a severe manic episode. I do not know who this is from, but it says, please pray for the safety of our friend Wayne, who is an oncology nurse. He has several COVID-19 positive coworkers and has been exposed to COVID-19 positive patients. Who uh, put, posted that one up? Okay, it must be an administrator because it came from Robbinsdale Parkway, so I'm sorry, I don't know whose friend that is. Uh, Jody Walters asked us to pray for Bernard's safe return from the Dakotas where he was on Masonic business. And Carol Bullchuck and I ask you to pray for our niece, Christina, who has tested positive for COVID-19. She lives in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Oh, the um, other one, uh, one friend from Wayne was from Karen and Jean Montanez. Any other prayer requests? Thank you. Let us continue then with the service. Good morning, Parkway. I'm happy to be here. And please join me in the call to worship. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. How can we love like light? How can, we love, how can our love be salt? Help us to give form to the love of God.
ready? One, two, three. Thank you. I love that song. And now, um, as we're kicking off our stewardship campaign, our pledges for next year, and time to start thinking about that, we've asked our friends, our beloved friends, Shar and Greg Mertz, to uh, come up and share with us. They've been very committed to the church for a very long time, as have many and many of you. So they're uh, willing to kick it off. So thank you, Shar and Greg want to stand up right about by the blue tape. Thank you. Good morning, my friends. I'm Char Mertz. I work in the office, so, uh, so most of you probably know me already. 
I'm very sorry that we haven't been able to see one another face to face for so long. Standing beside me here, right here, is my handsome, amazing, intelligent, and all around wonderful husband, Greg. Say hello, Greg. Hello, Greg. When Greg asked me if I would say a few words this morning about stewardship, I'll admit that I was reluctant. Talking about stewardship is like stewardship itself. Something that I know is really, really important, but also something I'd rather not talk about. It's uncomfortable. But when Greg, did I mention how wonderful Greg is? Okay. Uh, offered to write my remarks for me after asking me several questions about what I'm passionate about in the church and what I'd like to see in the church, I could hardly resist, resist that, so I agreed. Consecration Sunday is coming. Just like everything else that happens to us in this weird time beyond time, it will be here before you know it, November 8 to be exact. If you're watching this, chances are that I don't need to tell you how important stewardship is. We are the church. We are a family. We depend on one another, just like members of a family depend on one another. And it's been these last several months when I couldn't see my church family that has really emphasized how important family is to me. I'll admit there's a side of stewardship that is boring, really, really boring. It's hard to get very excited about keeping the lights on and the water on, keeping the church warm in the winter and cool in the summer paying to have the snow plowed off the parking lot and the garbage hauled away, buying office supplies, toilet paper, access to the internet. I could go on, but it's really boring. But those things and many, many more are very important, necessary even. There is a side of stewardship that I do get excited about, very excited about, and I hope that you do too. I get excited about all of the ministries that the church makes possible, all of the ways that the church reaches out to those in need. Families moving forward, Red Cross blood drives, PRISM, mobi mobility worldwide, Common Hope, our youth mission trip, and our special assistance fund, which has been very active. You likely have some mission at Robbinsdale Parkway that you're involved in that you're very passionate about. We can do so much more together than any of us could do alone. And without the boring things, we couldn't do all the exciting things. As Greg and I are thinking about our pledge for the coming year, one of the things that we'll be thinking about is what it means to, what it means to be the church and how, by being the church, we are able to express our love for our brothers and sisters and maybe make someone's burden a little lighter. In the next few weeks, as you think about your commitment to Robbinsdale Parkway, please think about what your passion is in what our ministries and what we can do together. And finally, I, can move my hair. I would be remiss if I didn't thank Greg for these inspirational words that he's written for me today and for, well, just being him. Thanks, honey. You're the, you're the best. And I know that because that's what it says right here on my piece of paper. <laughs> Thank you. Greg, such a wonderful author. We all know you're the best. Thank you, Shar, for those words. Um, I'm sure they've touched, touched many people. Um, this is the scripture for this week um, from the first letter of John. He writes, We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us, and whoever is not from God does not listen to us. From this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit, spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. 
Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may, be, may, may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. And from Matthew, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything but must be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your God in heaven. Thank you, David, and thanks, Char and Greg. Let's center ourselves for just a minute. Goodness. <laughs> Perfect love casts out fear. That's how one of the paragraphs in John ends. And that's something that I've heard over and over in different places and different formats over the years. And it always makes me feel a little less than. I think I try to be a loving person, and most people would think, yeah, you're reasonably, you do all right. But um, if it's a matter of casting out fear, I don't think so. I think I, I fear the world changing in ways that are not so good. The decimation of species, ecology, or global warming. I worry about my children and my grandchildren. Are they going to be able to experience nature and the beauties and wonder and awe that I have experienced Yes, but maybe not with as much. I worry about COVID. I worry about the elections. Don't even get me started. I worry about Carol's cancer. I worry about my own. And this week was not a good week. Last, last week, the week before. Any case, I went down to Mayo to get, I'm getting ready for radiation. And um, one of the things they do before you start radiation is they have to kind of the machines map out specifically all the areas of where it's going to be radiated, like extremely precise measurements. So I'm in there, fine, everything's cool. And then afterwards they said, you know what, we have a problem. Where you had surgery, there's developed a cavity with fluid. And that's not any earth-shaking thing, with the exception that it screws up your radiation. You can't do it as long as you have that, because the fluid, fluid throws off the measurements. What's supposed to be adhered together is separated with fluid. And so you're screwed. So. Um, what they do is uh, you go down and several times they, they put in a drain, a surgical drain, and then they um, flush it out with a caustic substance and that roughs up the edges and helps it adhere faster. But it's not a one-time shot, it's several things. So this, of course, also postpones your radiation. I had the whole situation set in Rochester. Some family of friends of ours had volunteered to let me stay with them. I was ready and it's like, oh, okay. So I was filled with a lot of fear. I was filled with anxiety. Like, okay, putting caustic substances inside of me. Gee, that does, uh, doesn't sound real pleasant. I'm not the most comfortable people, person with medical procedures anyway. It's like, well, is this going to hurt? Is it going to hurt later? I don't like the idea of hurting at all. <laughs> you know, Not to mention putting off radiology for a couple more weeks, and it's already been put off before several times with surgery. And it's like, well, what does that do? So when you think of perfect love casting out fear, let me tell you, I wasn't feeling like a perfectly loving person. I had very little experience of feeling like, oh, I am just surrounded by the love of God and tooling on with my life. Did not happen that way. But I did what I needed to do, went to all of my appointments, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to change things. I'm just going to be like straightforward honest <laughs> and say, yeah, I'm anxious about this, and I'm worried about this. And I did. And without failure, the people were extremely kind, every single one of them, gentle, telling me the truth. And it's not all everything lining up exactly the way I want it to, but the reality is everybody's doing their best in an imperfect world to make this as good for me as it possibly can be. And it was. It was not a big deal, and I'm still, which is good because I'm still doing it. But it really wasn't. 
So that perfect love casts out fear. I was thinking about that later, and I thought, you know what? It's not my love that's casting out fear. It's your love is casting out my fear. When I'm honest and say, I'm afraid, I don't want this, I'm anxious, I'm, tell me the statistics, what does this do? Um, everybody was honest back and really caring and really kind. And in fact, at, I get cold all the time. And in one of those procedure rooms, you're always cold. So they're putting on warm blankets, they're putting on, they're doing everything. And I say, you know what, I'm sorry, but I am still cold. And this guy took a warm blanket and I thought he was going to put it over my feet and instead he came around and he tucked my head around it. And it was like, oh, how sweet. You know, that in itself is comforting. It's your love that casts out my fear. And that brings us to how can you say you love your neighbor if you're, you love God if you're not loving each other? Those who love each other, that's how you're loving God. It's like a net that we contribute to. And the more you contribute to it, the stronger it gets. The more I'm loved and reassured, the more I can love and reassure others, because I know what it's like. It strengthens it, and it generates more. And that, I think, is exactly what John is talking about. We have to love one another. It's not up to me. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. He didn't say, it's up to me, Jesus. It's up to you. And it's up to me. And that's what we do for each other. And that's how we keep it moving on. I picture it like a net of love and caring across the world through all of the different relationships and interpersonally. And what happens to me, you know, our, our ex-son-in-law, recently said, could I live with you guys in your basement? Well, that would not have been high on my list of things I wanted to do like a year ago. It may not be right now, but Carol and I were talking about it. We said, you know what? We're going to Rochester and we're practically living there right now. And uh, strangers, sisters of a friend of ours said, they can stay at our house. We've got a spare bedroom. We've got a spare bathroom. They're helping us. I said, Tara, do you know how much money we have saved by not having to stay in hotels twice a week? And then every day, once I start radiation, it's like, yeah, you can probably stay with us. We might have said that anyway. But because somebody offered to, to us, it was more in the top of our mind. Like, we can do this for somebody else. And I think that's exactly what John is saying. This net of caring and love that God has across the world, the more we do it, the more someone else does it, and it catches on. John was writing this in the between, between the year 95 and 110 AD. And what was going on at that time? I have no idea, so I looked it up. What was going on at that time was that his community had weathered the whole Christianity separating from Judaism kind of thing to a certain extent. They weren't being kicked out of synagogues anymore. That wasn't as top in their minds. But what had happened is the Christian community had fought about and had big disagreements over how much is Jesus really human or how much is Jesus God? And what's with this shedding blood for our sins anyway, that atonement idea? And so they had a big disagreement about it. And John's community had split off. A lot of them had left because they weren't happy about it. And John is writing this to them, and he's saying that whole thing about we have to love each other well and strongly and keep it going. And even those who've left us, we have to keep praying for. And I thought, that's kind of like the elections. That's kind of like having our family over when somebody's a Republican and somebody else is a Democrat, and how do you have Thanksgiving? Or how do you get together for a family, a birthday party, and not kill each other, you know? And, and then I thought, it's like Facebook. When Carol's cousin, who's a rabid politically person, <laughs> I, on the other hand, am not rabid. I'm just committed to all the right causes. But <laughs> when this guy posts all this stuff, and it's not even true, and I know darn well it's not true, do I say, this is insane nonsense? Or does that just light a fire that makes hatred grow? 
Or does it correct people to say, oh, gee, maybe I should look up these sources and find out they're not real? I don't know. What's the most loving gesture? It's not like there's an answer to that. You know, we've got, when you're in the elevator and somebody's wearing their hat and you've got a t-shirt for the other party, how, do you, how are you respectful and kind to each other? And that's what John was talking about in this letter. That was exactly it. We still have to love each other 100%, regardless of what the other person believes and how absolutely mistaken they are in every single one of their beliefs. We got to figure out a way, and that's important, before the elections, during the elections, and after the elections, because that's not who they are, and it's not who I am. It's a set of beliefs that is part of that. It reminded me, when I was in college, I had a relative who did something that I thought was completely despicable and hurt me and my family. And I went to the campus minister and complained about it. And it was so clear, so clearly despicable. And I thought this campus minister would say, oh, you poor thing. <laughs> what an awful thing that somebody did. And what the campus minister said instead was, the poor man. He probably felt like he didn't have any choice. It's not what I wanted to hear, but it stuck with me. Because what formed him and his experiences to lead him to that and what formed me and my experiences to lead me to this? And even on the political spectrum, there's a reason people feel like this, and there's a reason people feel like this. And can we look at that person rather than where they're at here? Can we look at how are they? Are they hurt? Are they afraid? Is that what they're acting out of? Rather than going up to here. I love the fact that John said, God is love. And those who live in love live in God and God lives in them. And you can't say you love God if you aren't loving other people. Because God is so enormously abstract. They could have said, God is power, and he who does not have power does not live in God. They could have said, God is all-knowing, and he or she who isn't knowing a lot of stuff isn't living in God. But no, any of the adjectives you could use to choose God in the whole world, they chose love. That's kind of amazing, and it's kind of great. And I love that last line of one of the paragraphs that Jesus, that Jesus read, yes. Jesus read, <laughs> Jesus sketch, <laughs> David read, which said, as he is, so are we in the world. As Jesus is, so are we. We are created of God. We are born of God. That's what we do. Keep it going. Amen. Amen. Oh, let's do prayers. <sighs> Community prayers. Join me. Oh God, we have so many thoughts and needs and desires and fears and attributes that are wonderful and action-oriented gestures of loving kindness and eyes looking at each other with love and words. Help us to continue and strengthen these and help us to be honest when we need it from other people. Help us to listen to one another and see hearts, not just beliefs. Because as important as they are, the hearts are more important. Help us to respond to each other here and across the world with actions and gestures and words and thoughts and prayers of love. Strong love that changes things.
heal those who need healing, give strength to those who need strength and courage to all of us. Help us remember that we are part of your breeze of the Spirit of God that blows across the earth. As he is, so we are in the world. Amen. And let's join together in the words that Jesus taught us, our Father and Mother who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. And now I'll invite you to the offertory. Um, please feel free to mail checks, sign up, talk to Shar, call the office, and leave a, or email her, and leave a message for her that you'd like to sign up for automatic withdrawal. Touch the thing on Facebook, your link. We welcome this sign of your love as well. Amen. Dona nobis pacem, Dona nobis pacem. Dona nobis pacem, Dona nobis pacem.
Thank you so much, Quartet. And thank you to all of you for your generous contributions to our church and our ministries. Join me in the prayer of dedication. We offer these gifts to be salt and light for all people. May we continue to use our bodies, minds, and voices to be advocates for you, Holy One, spreading love like a wildfire throughout the world. Amen. Amen. Closing hymn. <laughs> Steve, as he is, so are we in the world. Let us go out with Jesus' joy, with his courage, with his peace, and with his love. Amen.